Hey everybody, welcome back to Bible Funky Duns. Today we're in Habakkuk chapter number two, so let's get started. Okay, so you know the book of Habakkuk is built on questions. It's a book built on where the prophet is asking God questions and God is responding to these questions. Now what's interesting about this is most of the time, the prophets are built in a way where God has a message for people. But Habakkuk is kind of the opposite of that, where the people have some kind of ingrained questions that they want to ask God about. And what they're doing is they're looking at life, and their big complaint is, it doesn't seem fair. Like, why are the bad people getting the good stuff, and your good people are, are really suffering? So this is a book about suffering. What's interesting, though, is how when we read Habakkuk, uh, like usually we always think we're on the good side of things. For instance, when was the last time you read David and Goliath and you and you considered yourself more like Goliath than you did like David? Probably not that many times. Probably not that many times. Or you read about David and Saul and you and you think you're the hero like David and you're mistreated like Saul does. But what but but what are those guys? Like Goliath was an enemy of God and a rebel. Well, what does the New Testament say about us? That in our sin, we are enemies of God and we deserve the wrath of God. Well, that's more Goliath than it looks like David at that point. Or Saul, he was a guy who was really trying to protect his kingdom and David was becoming more and more of a threat. Well, look, if somebody came and, and was gonna and was gonna take over what you had worked for, how would you treat them? And so when we read this, we always read things thinking that we're the good guy in the situation. But Habakkuk is trying is almost hearing that, well, what what if we're not as good as we think we are? And so as the story starts in chapter number two, Habakkuk is is being told and he obeys to go to the top of the city, top to the of the rampart. A rampart in verse number one is like a lookout tower. It's a place where soldiers watch for armies that are coming in. And uh, and he and he and he says, I'm going to be watching for the enemy coming. The Babylonians were coming. And then he says, this is my favorite phrase in all the chapter. It happens in verse one. He says, and what will I answer when I am corrected? I want you to understand this is an important question. When God tells us that we're in the wrong on something, how are we going to respond? Are we going to fuss? Are we going to fight? Are we going to argue? We're going to give excuses or we're going to go, yeah, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I need to change. I, like how we respond is a, is a really important deal to this. So the Lord tells Habakkuk, he says, listen, I want you to go and I want you to write this down. Write down the vision you're about to see. Writing all of this down ensures that history will be a witness of all of God keeping his promises. And, um, and then it says in verse three, he says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but it will, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So in our lives, just know this, very few times does life offer instant solutions <coughs> to life's problems. Bless you. Um, what were instant action is usually more often wrong than patient action. And so God says, look, you want this to happen instantly, but just know this is going to take time. So while you're waiting, if you get tired of waiting, here's what you do. Just keep waiting. Uh, so really, this this moves on, and it moves into one of the one of the, even the the more important elements. You're going to see this one all throughout Scripture, and it's about how we see life and how we live. Well, this was your takeaway. What'd you get? Okay, uh, so uh, Habakkuk, he's a lot like us in that we view things with a very flawed perspective because uh, we have a bias towards ourselves um, and towards other things, uh, and so we uh, find it hard to find ourselves as like the villains of the story like we were just talking about. Um, but God sees like this full picture of everything. And uh, so a lot of this has to do with faith and like uh, believing what he says over what we see with our own eyes because we know he sees the full picture while we only see uh, what we see. That's right. Uh, the way the chapter ends is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a stab at idolatry, having idols, worshiping false gods. Because prior to exile, the, the sin that keeps on coming back in Israelite culture was that they would worship idols. And so like he, he ends here, he says, 
He says, what profit is the image? Remember the, the Ten Commandments, you shall have no graven images. It was about idol, uh, idolatry and idols. What profit is the image? The answer is there's no profit in them at all. They can't do anything for you. He says that its maker should carve it or a molden image as it's a teacher of lies that the maker of its mold should trust in it or make mute idols. Woe to him who says to a block of wood, wake up or to silent stone, arise and teach me. Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. Now, if there's no breath, compare this to what Genesis chapter 2 was when God made man. What did God do? God breathed in the man the breath of life and he became a living man. There, here, man is trying to be God, creating an image that, that would then have breath and, and be as God. It's crazy because man spends so much uh, so much effort on things that can't bring them that can't bring them satisfaction in life idolatry idols in all their form are fantasies that cannot satisfy now this is where jeb's takeaway was jeb come around here jeb tell us tell us what you said about having idols and how crazy it is so idols why would you believe in them cuz you just watch yourself make them and then you suppose they just come alive? I mean, that's exactly right. So, like, if I carved a, the, uh, a picture of a person out of wood, like, is it smart to worship that? No. Because our God made us, and we carved the wood. Yeah. So, which one is the real God? The maker of everything. By the way, where did the wood come from? God made the wood, of course. And so he's this is just this is just one of those idols are lifeless, but God is alive over all. And so unlike idols, which cannot breathe, cannot speak, cannot see, idols are mute, deaf, dumb, and powerless. Uh, but God sits on the throne of heaven and rules over all. And so what Habakkuk is being told, he says, I need you to sit. I need you to think, and I need you to wait. All of the promises God makes, he keeps. But he also, in all of this waiting, it gives him time to think about who is the real God of everything. And at the end of the day, it's not idols. It's the Lord God Almighty. Jax, you got anything to follow up with? I think we got it, though. I think we got it. All right, enjoy. We'll see you tomorrow in chapter number three. Bye. Bye.